daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Chinese President Xi Jinping has called for building the BRICS Group for peace, innovation, justice, and green development. Chinese tech firm Huawei has released the latest version of its self-developed operating system. China and India have reached a resolution on issues concerning their border area. Welcome to World Today, a news program with a different perspective. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. Chinese President Xi Jinping has called for building the BRICS Group for peace, innovation, justice, and green development. He also stressed the importance of turning the group into a major venue of cooperation for the global South. The president made the call when addressing the 16th BRICS summit in Kazan, Russia. Xi Jinping urged the member states to advocate peaceful coexistence and harmony between civilizations, and highlighted the urgent need for reforming the international financial architecture. The summit is the BRICS' first high-level meeting since its expansion. Now, for more, we're joined by Dr. Wang Huiyao. He is president of the Center for China and Globalization, a think tank based in Beijing. Thank you, Dr. Wang. It's good to have you back on the program. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. Wang,、uh, the BRICS. Was first coined by、uh, Goldman Sachs、uh, investment banker Jim O'Neill.、Uh, now, after these years of development, at what stage is the BRICS mechanism, and what is it, what is its main mission for leading the global South countries today? Yes,、uh, thank you. Yes, I think the、uh, you know the BRICS actually,、uh, as you are absolutely right, the, it was a, a short form、uh, proposed by. Jim O'Neill, <clears throat> which I had a, a dialogue with him just a, a year ago,、mm. that he had to propose that in in a, a year around year two thousand sometime. But then later on, I think by two o six, the four minutes of the original four countries:、uh, Brazil, uh, you know, uh, Russia, uh, uh, China, and and of course,、uh, India. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 those four countries actually.、Mm. Did that, and and then they added the, and of course India, and then they later added the,、uh, South Africa to, into this、uh, BRICS now. So it's become BRICS countries. The mechanism is is really expanded and enlarged. Last year、uh, at the BRICS summit,、uh, this、uh, current five countries now has doubled to ten、uh, countries now, and、uh, so it's greatly become a, a, a regional and, and a multilateral platform for representing the. Developing countries, emerging economies, and global south. I think it's gained more momentum, particularly since last year, because、uh, this doubling of the BRICS has expanded. It's, it's almost reached the 50 percent of global population,、mm. and it's already uh, on the purchase of, uh, uh, you know parity、uh, on the GDP. It's already larger than the G7,、mm. and of course, it also accounts about one third of the global trade. Uh, so this is quite significant. I think for the first time, Global South has a really a, a very strong platform now on the global stage. And then, as we're saying, we're getting the multipolar world, and this is certainly a big a polo that is uh, shaping uh, up and and going to contribute to the future uh, global uh, peace and prosperity. And also, the, the, the BRICS now is more actually emphasized on, on economic development, on,、mm. on, on the security, on the peace. So. So there's a wide range of、uh, impact there.、Mm. Well,、um, President Xi Jinping made some an- announcements in his speech at the summit. He said China will establish research institutions on several areas, including deep sea resources, industrial capability, digital ecology, etc., within the BRICS mechanism.、Uh, how do you understand? The significance of conducting research on these areas for BRICS countries. Yes, I think it's quite significant. Uh, uh, first of all, I think that the BRICS countries are largely made of the emerging economy and of developing countries, and also in terms of uh, uh, science, technology, and particularly in uh, uh, those industrial uh, capacity, uh, digital economy, and and also、uh, green uh, development. It actually, I think, was not that.、Uh, Uh, advanced as traditional uh, uh, developed countries, so it, China actually among the old BRICS countries 
probably is one step ahead on many of those uh, technologies. For example, uh, China is the second largest digital economy. Next, just to the United States, China is probably the largest green power uh, economy now. China, uh, over half of China's uh, energy is renewable energy now. And, uh, and also China is uh, on industrial uh, capacity. China is, uh, is the uh, global value chain center and, and, and made in, in the world center uh, right here in China. So, so I think in, in, that, uh, you know, in those respects, and it's quite uh, good for President Xi to announce that uh, uh, you know, China would like to assist and help uh, to establish those centers. Mm. Which is great, uh, you know, in terms of industrial uh, center, in terms of uh, green uh, uh, development, and of course, particularly the digital economy as well. I, I think those are, uh, particularly for the global south countries, are lacking mm. Uh, mm. those capac- cap- capabilities. And then China can really help uh, to uh, uh, promote and, and strengthen the ca- capacity in, in, for the developing countries. We see there's a big disparity among the BRICS countries. You have some countries country in the Gulf, which have a per capita of over 50,000 U.S., and, and then you have uh, countries like Ethiopia has about 1,000 U.S. Mm. So, so I think China's uh, commitment and, uh, and also uh, contribution to really to, to help all those great countries to do that is really a great gesture. I think this is great uh, momentum, and also China can uh, benefit uh, by this cooperation uh, and also contributing to the uh, developing countries. Mm, very exciting prospect, actually. Um, President Xi Jinping also highlighted the importance of maintaining peace, innovation, and a green development for BRICS countries. Um, now, how do you understand China's vision in these areas for the BRICS mechanism? Yes, I think, you know, uh, we are actually in a the, in the, in the world is really... Uh, Getting more and more uh, chaotic and dangerous, you know. Mm. I mean, as a matter of fact, this year is the 18th year, 18th year of uh, uh, you know Britain Wood system. Mm. It's the 15 years of a uh, BRICS uh, country uh, mechanism. Yet we see the world is really getting you know more and more risky now. We have uh, uh, you know conflict going on in Ukraine. We have conflict going on in the Middle East, and and then uh, you know the the, the global South. Particularly, the uh, uh, you know all the developing countries, they don't want to you know see the world getting cha- chaotic, mm. and getting uh, a very uh, a geopolitical uh, 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 polarized. So I think you know this is important. The BRICS now is is already uh, probably countries, a lot of countries are fed up with what's going on. I mean, in those uh, uh, double standards on on the Middle East and and also the, the, the con- continued drag on on, on the war. In the Ukraine, and then they want to, you know, help, and they want to promote the peace. So, so China and Brazil and, and South Africa and many other countries actually had this uh, Friends of Peace initiative. I think in, initiated the UN, right. and also China is is really like to work with, uh, you know, global South countries to really calm down on this uh, crisis in in the mid, mid, Middle East for this humanitarian disaster and uh, and also the huge casualties of of the of the. Of the of the ordinary uh, folks uh, in, the, in the region. So I, I think BRICS has, has a huge role to promote the peace. And of course, on that, and, and, and in addition to that, there's a, there's a green development. We are, mm. we are faced by the climate crisis. Climate change is, is really impact every country, uh, no matter rich or poor. So uh, I think in that area, the green development, which China had harnessed that power, uh, which is great to help uh, uh, BRICS countries as well and give them some new potential to develop the technology and, and, and also products in those mm-hmm. areas. China can transfer those technologies in, in, in many ways. So, so I think there's, there's quite a lot of areas that need a, a country's a platform like BRICS to really mm-hmm. stabilize the world and then put, put in the world uh, into the right direction. So it's so important now, this high-level summit is held. Mm. Well, we have about 30 seconds, uh, Dr. Wang, but uh, President Xi Jinping also said that uh, the new development bank needs to be strengthened to better reflect today's international economy. How do you understand these remarks? This is a very key, key crucial remarks, mm-hmm. actually. You know, the, the new development bank, actually, we need a, 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 the, brick, the bigger BRICS, the greater BRICS. So we need a, a you know, BRICS uh, countries payment system, probably. So the, it, BRICS can be a really uh, experiment platform. But mm-hmm. testing all kind of technology, testing all kind of payment uh, innovations, and so we have a better, uh, you know, 
uh, platform to generate all those new ideas, new technique and a new mm-hmm. system, which is great and that uh, is badly needed in this uh, right. world. Thank you. We appreciate your time and insight. That was Dr. Wang Huiyao, president of the Center for China and Globalization, a think tank based in Beijing. Coming up, Chinese tech firm Huawei released its latest version of its self-developed operating system. You're listening to World Today. Stay with us. As one of CGTN Radio's most popular programs, World Today provides listeners with a strong mix of international news and business. It delivers in-depth analysis of current affairs and one-on-one interviews. We need the stories behind the news, not just what's happening, but why. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Chinese tech firm Huawei has released the latest version of its self-developed operating system. Executive Director Yu Chengdong says over a billion users have already installed Harmony OS on their computers and devices. In fact, our development team has gone through the path that others have gone through for 20 or 30 years in just 10 years. The battery life, security, and privacy protection functions of the phone are very strong. The application's version is being developed iteratively every day. The update schedule is very, very fast. I estimate in another two or three months, maybe enough time for our whole ecosystem to mature. Well, the company first released the open source operating system in 2019. How many OS has replaced Apple's operating system as the second most popular in the Chinese market? Xu Hua has more on the reactions of the consumers. Huawei says Harmony OS Next is a completely independent operating system for mobile, computer, and smart wearables. Some of the early movers are impressed. It seems to be more power efficient, which is something I appreciate, especially since I make a lot of phone calls and use WeChat a lot. The system is quite smooth as well, without any jarring, and the entire interface has been redesigned to be more flat and minimalistic. I like it. Huawei says its Harmony OS ranks the second in the Chinese market, with 6.7 million registered developers and over 1 billion ecological devices. According to counterpoint research, Harmony OS made up 17 percent of China's smartphone market in Q1 of 2024, surpassing iOS 16 percent and becoming the second largest operating system in China after Android's 67 percent. With Android and iOS already well-established operating systems, can Huawei's new platform compete with its counterparts? And will its new version see an influx of users? Apple Shop. My phone is Apple 12. I won't consider changing it because I'm used to it, and sometimes I need to use some of its apps. There are many apps available on Harmony OS Next yet, so I won't switch to it right away. Instead, I'll continue using my current operating system, the older version of Harmony OS or iOS. New options. New options. Oh, yes. New option. Yes. Very, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. In terms of the product, Huawei represents our country's scientific and technological strength. Second, it is a kind of patriotism. We, as Chinese people, must support Chinese domestic products. The source code of the Android system is indeed open to users and developers. Why did Huawei still develop its own operating system? As a leading enterprise in scientific and technological innovation in China, Huawei bears the responsibility of providing a public operating system for Chinese manufacturing and addressing the technical bottleneck that arises in the current great power competition. Cao believes that Huawei's self-developed operating system could have a substantial impact on China's manufacturing industry in the future, potentially becoming the fundamental infrastructure for both China's and the world's digital economy. That was Xu Hua with the report. Now, for more on this, we're joined by Andy Mock. He is tech analyst and senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. 
Thank you, Andy, for joining us. Overall, how do you characterize this development? Because、uh, some have said that Harmony OS、uh, Next is a milestone in China's history of developing its own homegrown operating system. I would completely agree with that assessment.、Um, first of all, I think it's important for、uh, people that do not work、uh, in computer software. To understand that it is incredibly complex and difficult to develop a, a new operating system, it's somewhat like、uh, building a civilian aircraft、uh, in terms of the complexity and the technical expertise it requires. So, I would completely agree that、uh, this is a milestone、uh, for Huawei and for China to have a fully self-developed. Uh, operating system、uh, that is not based on the Linux kernel、mm. um, and is a, a complete、uh, open Harmony open source core.、Mm. So yes, I agree, it is a milestone.、Mm. Well, then, in your observation, what factors have contributed to this、uh, successful development and release of the、uh, Harmony OS Next? Well, I think there's two、uh, factors here. One. Is I think Huawei's commitment、uh, to research and development and to being a technology leader. The second is、uh, the sanctions levied by the U.S. that you know I think most people would agree now have completely backfired. In that it was meant they were designed to hobble Huawei's and China's technological rise, and I think in fact. Has had the opposite effect of accelerating、uh, Huawei's move away from American technologies, and of course, this has hurt、uh, key American technology suppliers.、Uh, while、uh, again creating, I think, greater independence、uh, for both Huawei and for China. Mm. Well, let's let's take a look at the 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 sanctions then, because the U.S. started sanctioning Huawei in May 2019.、Uh, since then, Huawei wasn't able to use the Android system、uh, developed by Google. How do you comment on the strategy taken by Huawei to realize the mission of developing an operating system that's completely independent of Android or iOS by Apple?、Uh, what path has Huawei taken? Well, I think that I would describe this as highly unfortunate, in that、mm. history shows that、um, everyone benefits when companies and countries can work together to use the best technologies, the best approaches、uh, developed anywhere in the world. So,、uh, the fact that Huawei had to take this path, I think, is unfortunate. But it has shown, though. Again, that、uh, Huawei's resilience, I think,、uh, its depth of technical expertise, and I think the the broad talent pool、uh, at Huawei、uh, shows that these measures by the U.S. have backfired, and not only backfired for Huawei, but I would say、uh, China overall.、Mm. Well then, what does it mean for Chinese consumers and enterprises to have a homegrown operating system instead of,、uh, you know, relying on overseas companies? Well, I think you know consumers ultimately will benefit.、Mm. Um, certainly, losing、uh, not just、uh, an operating system like Android, but the entire ecosystem. So it's important to point out here that there's consumers,、um, there's the companies like the Huawei's. Uh, the apples that provide the hardware, but also the operating systems.、Um, but very importantly, there are the application、uh, writers or developers.、Mm. And an important decision is whether、uh, app developers will create applications、um, for a new platform、um, like Harmony. And I think what we see, because of the size of the Chinese market,、um, that. You know, this is, I think, a market that is impossible to ignore. So, I think in the long run,、uh, this will be good for Chinese consumers. But again, I think it's unfortunate、uh, that you know this had to happen.
Mm. Well, then talking about uh, this uh, big market uh, in China, about the Chinese consumers, uh, is it one of the factors that have contributed to the success of Harmony uh, OS Next? Because uh, if you want to release this uh, operating system, you have to do a lot of experiments, right? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say experiments per se, mm. um, but again, it is uh, technically very challenging. Mm. Um, it is also complex, um, you know, to kind of uh, jump into uh, a little bit of, of how operating systems work. You know, you have to interact directly with different pieces of hardware. Mm. Security is very important, uh, managing memory. And if you have any mistakes, it will cause the whole thing to to crash, uh, perhaps even very destructively damaging hardware, et cetera. So again, it takes a lot of technical expertise. It takes a lot of uh, management uh, ability as well. And you know, this is considered one of the most difficult things to do in the software world. So that I think that Huawei uh, succeeding with this really is a testament. Uh, to their competence mm. in technology, as well as the ability to manage complex projects. Mm. Well, statistics show that in the first quarter of this year, 68% of uh, smartphones sold on the Chinese market are based on Android, uh, 17% on Huawei Harmony, and 16% on iOS by Apple. What's your analysis of these figures? Well, I think these numbers, um, you know, are a artifact mm. of the fact that, you know, most phones uh, in the past in China ran on Android, whether that was Huawei, Xiaomi, or back in the old days, you know, some of the other mm. uh, handset makers. Um, and we're seeing a transition. And we have to recognize, too, that um, consumers don't change phones, uh, you know, every month. You know, it's maybe Indeed. more every few years. So, you know, we will see, I think, uh, growth, but this is, again, uh, not like a fast-moving consumer product where you might see uh, changes in share very quickly. Hmm. So uh, to improve uh, its consumer experience and market share uh, in the future, what do you think uh, how many OS Next need to do? Well, I think, um, you know, again, uh, there's uh, two populations that matter here. One are the consumers that buy the handsets, um, and the other are the, the, the universe of app developers. So I think that um, any platform, which we you know can understand this to be, um, has to target both sides. So make continuous improvements um, so that consumers want to buy Huawei handsets with Harmony uh, as the operating system, and make it uh, easier and profitable for app developers um, mm -hmm. so that, again, you're, you're growing the, the ecosystem. One more question, Andy, before I let you go. Um, we know that Harmony OS Next uh, can not only be used on cell phones, but also on other hardware as well. Uh, how do you see the prospect of uh, the operating system you know, spreading into, uh, for example, computer in China? No, I think that's such a great point, Kun, and I'm glad you brought it up. So I think Huawei certainly has a very complete technology vision that it's more than just smartphones, but it's, you know, as you say, uh, laptops, tablets, uh, televisions, even automobiles. And if they can be linked with one uh, unified operating system that is designed to integrate all of these different uh, hardware platforms and use cases, I think certainly that will be very, very powerful. Mm. But um, how, how would you predict uh, Huawei's prospect on that? Well, I think Huawei brings a lot of strengths to the table. Again, it is uh, vertically integrated in that it provides uh, the hardware devices and a wide range of hardware devices uh, from smartphones to tablets to laptop computers to automobiles to, to servers, mm. uh, as well as even the chips. So uh, I think it is in a very, very strong position. And of course, it is a market leader uh, in China. And I think it is doing well in other parts of the world as well. So certainly, I think it's very well positioned. Uh, to succeed in the long term. Thank you. There was Andy Mark, tech analyst and senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. 
Coming up, China and India reached a resolution on issues concerning their border area. Also, we take a look at the latest economic projection by the International Monetary Fund. You're listening to World Today. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. We'll be back after a short break. Welcome. I'm Elaf Elard, economics professor and member of the Data Science and AI Center at New York University Shanghai. On the World Today program, you can find in-depth and impartial insight, as well as critical commentary on key trends in the Chinese economy, financial technology, business, and blockchain. To prepare for the world tomorrow, join me on World Today. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. China and India have reached a resolution on issues concerning their border area. China's foreign ministry said on Tuesday that China gave a positive comment on the resolution, noting China will work with India for the implementation of the resolution. The ministry also said that China and India have maintained close communication through diplomatic and military channels on border issues in recent periods. For more, my colleague Ding Hong spoke with Gao Xirui, PhD candidate with the Department of Politics and Public Administration with the University of Hong Kong. First of all, how big of a move does this resolution represent towards improving the ties between India and China? I believe the military and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs might have been put huge efforts to reach this pact. It did move. One step closer to the normalization of bilateral ties, but of course the task is still heavy before China and India resolve border disputes, especially during the implementation. Hmm. So talking about implementation,、um, according to the message from the Indian side, both both sides have gone back to where the situation was back in 2020. So. What do you think could be the uncertainties, for example, in the implementation of the resolution? It's good news that bilateral relations is going towards a better direction compared to what we have been for the past four years. However, I think still lots of、um, risks are underlying、um, the uncertainties. For example, with the misperception, different collective beliefs, and India's victimhood. And sense of insecurity may still lead to uncertainties during the implementation. For example, misperception and different collective beliefs mean that maybe、um, there will be wrong understandings of each other side's intent or purpose due to different perceptions of legitimacy and legitimate lines. For example, a patrol may be deemed as transgression. And provocative action by the other side, so this may lead to misunderstanding during the implementation of the resolution.、Mm. Also, victimhood and insecurity of India may also undermine mutual trust, make it harder to implement the resolution.、Mm, I take your point. So, actually,、um, apart from the border issue between the two countries. There were other problems between the two sides as well. For example,、uh, the Indian side has been pretty much reluctant to resume direct flights between China and India after the end of the COVID-19 pandemic.、Uh, Indian authorities have,、um, in some form, flirted with Taiwan by, for example, allowing the opening of a Taiwan government representation、uh, office in the city of Mumbai. Which to Beijing, of course, appears to be a challenge to this very important One China principle.、Uh, there has also been a perceived lack of fairness in the ways in which Chinese investments, Chinese businesses in India have been treated since 2020. So, are you optimistic that、uh, with the、uh, resolution here,、uh, these contentious points on other areas, in other areas? Will also see improvements as well. Why or why not? As a matter of fact, 
I'm optimistic towards um, the border disputes, but I'm not that optimistic mm. towards um, the overall bilateral relations. New Delhi has put that resolving border disputes is the precondition to the normalization of bilateral ties. So before the pact is really implemented, it's unlikely that ties will be normalized, which means that the issues that you mentioned above are actually signals of a normalization of bilateral ties between China and India. But before the border mm. dispute is really successfully um, resolved, it's unlikely that um, the tie will be normalized and uh, it's unlikely that we'll see these signals. Mm. So I guess you have uh, touched upon a pretty um, key aspect when we talk about the border issue between the two sides, because um, for quite some time, there had been a gap in in Beijing's perception and in New Delhi's uh, perceptions. Uh, from China's perspective, this border issue is only uh, one aspect of the whole relationship, and it should not really hijack everything in this relationship. But in the eyes of India, as we heard from high-ranking Indian diplomats and high-ranking Indian officials, the border issue seems to be a precondition for uh, for the two sides to improve their entire relationship. Now with this resolution, do you think the Indian side will continue to use this border issue as a pretext to bar the improvement of the bilateral ties? I believe they will continue to use it as a pretext. So this resolution is a signal that both sides agreed to try to resolve the border conflict and get back to what it is in 2022. Hmm. But the whole dispute date back beyond 2020. Um, so New Delhi is still likely to use this as a pretext as no announcements have been made yet that um, they will uh, normalize um, the bilateral ties with China. Yeah. So when we talk about the foreign policy front um, of New Delhi recently, I guess a major drama recently was this further escalation of India's diplomatic uh, row with the Canadian government over last year's murder of a Sikh activist in Western Canada. So at a time when some some powers in the West, for sure, are seeking to court India as part of their attempts to contain China or reduce their economic linkage with China. Um, what do you think India should learn from this um, this episode with Canada, which we know has been going on for more than a year already? I think India, especially New Delhi, has learned that the West is not always in the interest of India, especially over issues like sovereignty. Why India cares so much this time about the murder of Sikh activists is because it's related to its sovereignty because these Sikh activists are deemed by New Delhi as separatists. They want to separate uh, the Punjab from India. So India cares a lot about its domestic security. And what India is doing now is actually treating um, countries differently inside the Western countries. For example, the India is acting very tough towards Canada because Modi still cares about its domestic audience. He wants to act tough on domestic, uh, especially sovereignty issues. But India is not acting that tough when U.S. is involved in this issue between India and Canada. Modi is um, is more sil is more silent when U.S. Uh, make a critique uh, on India's stance. So I think India has learned quite clear, and it's been more, even more clear that um, it's impossible for India to totally align with the West. And the Western countries are not always in the interest of India, but New Delhi still wants to leveraging its relation with the West either to contain or reduce their economic links with China or in serve of its own interest. So I think um, in the short run, they will not change its stance, but in the long run, India will be more aware of this. 
Gaosiri, PhD candidate with the Department of Politics and Public Administration with the University of Hong Kong. Coming up, we take a look at the trip by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to Israel. This is World Today. We'll be back. It's a battle that must be fought. The world's largest drone maker has taken the U.S. Defense Department to court. Shenzhen-based DJI says the Pentagon's blacklisting of the company as a national security threat to the U.S. is stigmatization, and it has caused financial losses and damage to its reputation. How big are DJI's chances at winning? What chain effects will it cause if DJI loses the case? What implications does DJI's experience have for other companies entering the U.S. market? Check out this week's Chat Lounge on your favorite podcast platform and on CGTN Radio. Welcome back to World Today. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has urged Israel to reach a ceasefire in Gaza and allow more humanitarian aid into the enclave. He said Israeli efforts to improve the situation in Gaza are so far insufficient. Blinken has met Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other senior leaders during his visit to the region. Earlier this month, Blinken and U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin demanded that Israel improve the humanitarian situation in Gaza or risk losing military aid. Netanyahu denied claims that Israel was implementing a siege to starve out northern Gaza. Now, for more, we're joined by Dr. Wang Jin. He is associate professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. Thank you, Dr. Wang. It's good to have you back. It's my pleasure again. Now, Dr. Wang,、uh, how do you comment on the purpose of this visit by Blinken? I think Blinken's visit、uh, comes as a very uh, uh, typical and particular time because, on the one hand, it's really、uh, military strikes against.、Uh, Uh, Lebanon is, is is continuing, and also the wars between Israel and Hamas has no、uh, prospect of peace. So, actually, from the perspective of the United States, that the war continues in the Middle East will uh, uh, might strongly affect the possible result of the presidential election that would come within two weeks. So that is why I think that it is very important for Anthony Blinken's purpose. And also, on the other hand, we have to know that the way the war continues between Israel and Hezbollah, between Israel and Hamas, and also between Israel and other regional actors, for example, the Hashem Shabi in Iraq,、uh, the Yemen Houthi, and also other Shia militias who have close ties with with Iran and、mm. these militias in Syria and Iraq. So that is why、uh, the regional countries, especially the Middle Eastern countries, who enjoy very close ties with the、uh, United States, they urge the United States to do something.、Mm-hmm. They urge the United States to、uh, to try to find the possible ways of ending the conflict and the crisis in this region and decrease decrease the tension in this region. So that is why it gives this backdrop that Anthony Blinken hopes to do something and to pay this visit to the Middle East and try his efforts to. Uh, to find a kind of the bridge or the mechanism for citizenship peace between Israelis and other conflicting parties.、Mm, well, quite a lot for him <laughs> to do.、Uh, U.S.、Yeah. officials confirmed that Blinken discussed uh, with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and、uh, Israeli Defense Secretary Yoav Gallant, quote unquote, the ways in which they can capitalize on what is a strategic success already. And some concrete steps that can be taken in between now and then that could effectively, effectively do that. By success,、yeah, he was referring to the death of a Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar,、uh, meaning that U.S. hope that Israel can take the opportunity to start a ceasefire. But、uh, we haven't heard from much from the Israeli side yet.、Uh, What? How do you comment on the considerations of、uh, the Israeli side? What's what's his possible plan now? I think Israel's plan is uh, still uh, constructed from its internal political idea, internal、uh, public opinion.、Mm. That is that the、uh, United States is not reliable. I mean, very interesting because、mm. from the perspective of the outsiders, many believe that United States ties with Israel is so strong. 
and their connections and their social public opinions should also trust each other. But actually, from the perspective of Israel, the United States is not reliable because the United States always uh, hopes to persuade Israel into ending the war, into ending the, uh, the, the strikes against the targets inside the Lebanon and Hezbollah. So from the perspective of Israel, that the war should continue. Mm-hmm. And uh, also the Hezbollah should uh, not be trusted. And the, 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 the very strategic goal inside the southern Lebanon and also in the Gaza Strip should be pursued through the very assertive manner, such, uh, rather than the very peaceful manner. So that is why uh, I, I don't think Israel uh, could accept the United States suggestion and also accept the United States' role for facilitating peace between Israel and Hezbollah and between Israel and Hamas especially asking Israel to make concessions. It would be very difficult to be realized. And uh, I think the United States would know that. So that is why the United States, so-called uh, the description uh, from the Blinken to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to uh, Yoav Gallant was mm. so uh, diplomatic way, I mean, so di- full of diplomatic rhetoric rather than a very simple and a clear message on how to do and what should be, do, what should be done next. Mm. So, uh, so that is why I think maybe Blinken will also face pressure, strong very pressure from Israeli pers- Israeli side rather mm. than uh, that Israel will accept the United States term very easily. Mm. Well, we have about a minute to wrap up the conversation, but uh, uh, we know that Israel has already started airstrikes on Beirut. Um, how, do you, how do you evaluate the risk of a further escalation of the war into a wider uh, you know, scale in the region? And uh, what is the end game for Israel? I think Israel will continue. The end game that the, the war will continue. Nobody knows how, actually, from Israeli perspective, they, they, they also don't know how to end the war. The only thing they, they know right now is that the war should be continued, that the Hezbollah should be further weakened, and the Hamas should be further weakened. So this is their priority uh, for their strategic uh, atmosphere. And also, when Israel attracts, uh, strikes uh, Beirut, they, 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 uh, their strikes and attacks against the Beirut has been lasted for uh, nearly one, more than one month. So, uh, because we know that in, in Beirut, especially in the southern Beirut, there were a lot of Hezbollah members, and from the perspective of Israel, there are a lot of the Hezbollah members and also Hezbollah strongholds. So mm-hmm. that is why Israel will, attacks will continue, and the Israeli military strike. And mm-hmm. uh, land forces in the southern Lebanon uh, attacks will continue. Mm-hmm. So we hope that uh, the peace could arrive as early as possible. Mm. Thank you. That was Dr. Wang Jin, associate professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. Coming up, we'll take a look at the latest economic forecast by the International Monetary Fund. This is World Today. Stay with us. Hello, my name is Alessandro Golombievski Teixeira. I'm a professor of public policy and management at Tsinghua University in Beijing. I am a great listener of The World Today. In my opinion, The World Today is one of the best China radio programs. In The World Today, we can get the best news and analysis in what is happening now in the world. So please, come to join us. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. The International Monetary Fund has maintained its global growth forecast at 3.2%, consistent with its July projection. In its latest World Economic Outlook, the IMF said the global economy is highly uncertain. The report also said that further intensification of geopolitical rifts could affect trade investment and the free flow of ideas. So where is the global economy heading and what are the challenges and opportunities? For more, my colleague Zhao Yang spoke with Professor Qu Qiang, a fellow of the Belt and Road Research Center at Minzu University of China. So, Professor Chu Qiang, thank you very much for joining us. The IMF maintained its uh, global growth forecast for this year at 3.2%, and this is the same as its previous projection. So, where do you think is the world economy heading for, and what are some of the biggest issues facing the uh, world economy? Well, I think the number one issue, uh, I think the risk is, is from the geopolitical side. Um, we'll be seeing the Middle East the crisis is still going on. Uh, Ukraine and Russian conflict is still going on, and uh, in many other places, smaller, you know, uh, conflicts are still bothering all the supply chains. So that can be a really uh, turbulent issue that impacting the whole supply chain of the whole world. 
And also seeing from the demand side, we've been seeing that major economies like uh, European Union, like Japan, uh, their inflation is still there. And also uh, their monetary policy and you know, also their uh, economic policies are impacting uh, the whole world uh, you know, supply side as well as for the demand side. Mm. USA, uh, for the United States, even though their stock market is already on the very high position, but uh, according to the Goldman Sachs, it's probably next year they're going to face a major landing of their whole economy. So I think all these uncertainties uh, <laughs> provided a lots of, uh, you know, unexpected uh, risks for the world economy in the next uh, one or two years. So I'm really worrying about uh, the whole expectations and the confidence. And the IMF is warning that the robust international trade is not going to be the economic super engine that it has been. And the uh, punitive trade tariffs that have been adopted by the U.S., EU, Canada and others, this is going to be a big reason for concern moving forward. So what's your take on that and how will this drag down the uh, global economy in the coming years? Well, world trade is still the most important factors that driving forward the whole world economy. Uh, I think uh, IMF warming is uh, uh, very, very correct because I think the America, European Union, Canada, all these OECD nations, they are actually the beneficiaries of the world economy and world trade rather than the donors or sponsor of the world trade. I think they made something wrong about their own positions in this uh, you know, world trade position. They think they are doing some charity. They are actually giving uh, the things out for the other uh, emerging economies or developing nations, but actually they're wrong. They are actually taking away the things and gaming from this current system. They think protectionism, uh, protectionism is uh, helping themselves or uh, giving their own workers, their uh, ordinary families and more people, uh, more of the things, but actually they're not. They're actually, if they are endangering the whole world trade system, if they are blocking other emerging market out of the whole system, they will be ultimately, you know, suffering from the whole consequences. So I think in the uh, future, if this uh, all kinds of the protectionism policies going on, or this uh, discrimination policy against the other nations trade going on, I think the whole world economy probably is going to be degrading by one or 2% uh, in the future. I think according to the IMF's projections, uh, well, probably we're going to have 3.2% of the GDP growth of the whole world this year. But if this policy goes on with the OECD nations, probably next year we're going to have like the 2% or 2.5% of the GDP growth in the next year to come. So what's your take on the IMF report saying that uh, the global debt is going to approach 100% of the world GDP by the year 2030? Yes, I think for most of the uh, emerging market, the uh, debt issue can be a real problem. For example, we visited Sri Lanka, we visited, uh, you know, Zimbabwe, and many of these uh, emerging markets are showing very bothering uh, and worrying uh, uh, level of the debt. Uh, so I don't think uh, if they can continue with the current uh, debt level, uh, the sta- sustainability of their economy can continues. And also for the uh, you know developed economy, for example, like America, like Japan, even though a lot of people are praising that uh, America are having a very strong uh, momentum of their economy, Japan are recovering from the uh, you know deflation. But if you take a look at the uh, debt uh, ratio and the debt level, Japan is more than 260%, America is more than 140%. And to take a look at the sheer value of their debt, America now has 35 trillion US dollar worth of the debt. So every year, even for their you know, uh, interest rate payment, it can be a really huge burden for the Federal Reserve. So I think the whole world right now are uh, relying too much on the debt and the borrowing uh, behavior. So if we do not have a major breakthrough in technology and a major change in the international trade and economic uh, structure, I don't think the current world economy can continue going on and with a growth. Mm. And the IMF sees the U.S. GDP increasing by 2.8% this year. So is it essential for the U.S. to get its debt issue under control? Well, I don't think America will get their debt issue under control because America right now is going on and fueled by the debt and borrowing. If the Federal Reserve stopped borrowing, if the federal government stopped borrowing, I think most of their economic 
you know, vitality will be drained out of America. I think currently the world economy relies too much on the OECD nations borrowing and their consumptions. So I think um, in the future, uh, the whole world need to change from this, uh, you know, structure. Not only America, not only the OECD nations, but also the emerging market. I mm-hmm. think the current structure of the whole world, like the IMF has already pointed out, is like the uh, poor nations are lending the money to the uh, uh, development nations to continue the current, uh, you know, momentum of the growth. But uh, ultimately, I don't think this is healthy because the poor nation lending money to the uh, developed nations so that they can continue with their consumptions and also keep on borrowing from the poor nations. This is like a pathology of the whole world economy. And in the future, we still will go back to the uh, the real track, uh, the right track, that is economic growth and also the consumption by all the nations, including the developing nations as well as for the developing nations together so that we can drive forward the overall well-being of the human being and overall the economic growth. Mm. And for the second largest economy in the world, China has recently rolled out a, a series of stimulus measures. So what's your thoughts on that? And how do you think that's going to play to boost China's economy? I think China is doing uh, absolutely correct. This is what I just mentioned. That is, emerging economy like China, the largest market in the whole world with uh, you know, 1.4 a billion people or with the 4 billion of the middle income class growing, they will, you know, concentrating on their own economy, concentrating on the domestic consumptions. Like China has mentioned about double, uh, double circulation. That is, we still need to pay attention to the international trade, but we also need to pay attention to the domestic consumptions. And I think current policy combo by Chinese government is putting forward more of the policies focusing on domestic consumptions, like the trading policies, like lowering the interest rate for the more, uh, mortgage and also the property market, like supporting the SMEs and the, the job market. And all these are putting back the money into the pocket of the middle income class, putting into putting back the money into the you know workers so that the, the domestic consumption can be triggered and more stimulated. Mm-hmm. So I think that this is the right way and can be more sustainable. Mm. And for the world economy, some countries clearly are bouncing back, uh, recovering more strongly than others. But who should we be worried about or who needs more help? Well, I think maybe probably everybody are focusing on how America can have a soft landing or even not landing, how America can continue to borrow money from the emerging market or consume more of the products. But actually, that is wrong. I think in the future, um, more of the focus should be put in, uh, into the emerging market, helping them to build on the momentum so, to repair their economy and also to, you know, have more of the remedy on their uh, consumptions and technology growth, uh, technology-based growth. So I think if we can make the focus correct, and now the world will face a major pivoting point. So we will focus on the real growth rather than just the borrowing and also this pathological growth like the, what we, d- we have already seen in the past. So more of the effort should be made to, you know, uh, transfer the growth momentum into the emerging market to lowering the barrier of the tariff to have more of the uh, policies support global trade and uh, you know global economic waters rather than to impede and slowing down the current you know uh, effort by you know major uh, traders and uh, manufacturers that was professor Xu Qiang, fellow of the belt and road research center at minsu university of china that is all the time we have for this edition of World Today. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Thank you for staying with us. Bye for now.